Um, so we're going to start the panel discussion in just a moment. I will introduce the panelists. And so, of course, we have the playwright, Paul Power, immediately to my left. Paul is an award-winning playwright who has spent the past 20 years working as a writer, actor, director, and communications professional. He has a long history of raising awareness and understanding about disability issues through his work as a playwright, columnist, and feature writer. Beside Paul, we have Sebastian Lavelle. Sebastian Lavelle is the executive director of the Bus Stop Theater Cooperative and the director of the Mayworks Halifax Festival, an annual labor and social justice themed arts festival. He is an actor by trade and will soon be seen in Corey Bowles' first feature film titled Black Call. Beside Sebastian, we have Josh Dunn in the middle of the panel. Josh is a Halifax comedian and poet, a veteran of the local comedy scene. He is one of the only working comedians in Canada with cerebral palsy. From the moment he crawls on stage, you know you're in for something different. His ability, sorry, his inability to stand forces a revolutionary approach to stand-up comedy. In 2014, Josh was the recipient of the Imagination Award, a $2,000 award created by ReachAbility to reward creative ideas intending to increase the inclusion of persons living with disabilities. Uh, beside Josh, we have our panelist, April Hubbard, who is the vice chair for the Atlantic Fringe Festival, and very recently was awarded the Merit Award for Volunteer of the Year. And uh, finally, our fine panelists on the far left, politically and stage-wise, maybe, uh, <laughs> uh, Leanne Poole. And uh, Leanne is an award-winning art writer and arts producer from Halifax. Uh, her work has been seen in Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, Fredericton, and Halifax. She was a 2014 and 15 recipient of the CFAT Media Arts Scholarship, RBC Emerging Artist Award, and a past winner of the Mayor's Award for Emerging Theatre Artist. Most recently, Leanne wrote and performed a country song at the Queer Acts Theatre Festival in Halifax. Currently, Leanne is working on Pony Play, a homoerotic western about the love between a man and his horse. She is currently the director of the Atlantic Fringe Festival. And so, just to begin, Paul, what prompted you to have a discussion about the civilian arts after your play? Um, well, I was fortunate enough to get a grant from the Canada Arts Council to uh, develop the curriculum. And uh, when I was applying for the grant, I was doing a lot of research uh, to make sure my application was unique and no one else was doing uh, what I was proposing to do with an artistic project. And I also wanted to know what other disability arts, or what they call arts, uh, uh, around the Atlantic region, and um, I couldn't come up with a lot, so I felt there was a need to bring uh, the arts and the disability community sort of in the spotlight, um, more so than it has been. Um, I'm not an expert, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but for some reason, either it doesn't exist or we don't know about it. Um, I went through a lot of like material and research done by the Canada Arts Council, um, they don't have a lot when it comes to the electric region, even though there seems to be a lot of activity in Ontario and out west uh, in Vancouver and some in Calgary uh, theater companies devoted to disability arts. Um, so I thought it would be a great opportunity to bring the arts community and the same community together and learn if there is uh, an art representation out there and if not, maybe we could make it happen. Wonderful. I'm familiar with, I believe it's the Tangled Arts Festival in Ontario. Mm -hmm. There's a group called Vocal Eye in BC. They do live description of theatrical works for people that maybe want to revision. Any of the other panels familiar with any groups in the Atlantic region that maybe have a focus on disability and disability? No. Bunch of shaky heads. No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wonderful. So obviously there is the need. Um, I'll ask each of you, based on your own experiences and travels, uh, in your opinion, where are we right now when it comes to representation of persons with disabilities? In the, in the arts, and we're looking both nationally and regionally. So I guess we'll start with Sebastian. Uh, I would say we're not very far along at all. Um, I can think of my own experience. I think locally here in Halifax, besides the work that Paul has brought here, not having been aware on the theater scene of any, uh, any theater companies or Productions that have a mandate and uh, that that centers around representation of disability. Um, there is the, 
at the, uh, the Blue Nose Ability Film Festival, which I think is organized by Reachability or associated with it, uh, which has emerged a couple of years ago. I don't know how old it is. It's, they just finished their second year. Second. Okay, I was going to say I only heard about it two years ago. So, great time. So, but as the name suggests, it's film. Uh, so, um, although this past year they had an opening screening here, which was a film, a documentary about um, dance and a, a professional dancer. Similar to that was invitation to dance. Yes, exactly. So, um, so despite being a film, there was about another art form. So there was some intersection there, I guess, uh, in terms of disciplines. But besides that, here locally, uh, I've been aware of anything, um, at least in my experience. Nationally, uh, I haven't heard of anything on the national scale other than uh, it was probably eight or nine years ago at Magnetic North Theater Festival, there was a show called Skydive. That was programmed, um, and I had seen that. Uh, so Skydive was, the, I think, the main writer or at least co-writer and one of the performers uh, had was. I don't think had any mobility below his neck, and so uh, performed with the help of a, a mechanical kind of chair, like a chair lift thing that kind of held in around the space, um, and that was kind of part of the play. It's the, the only play that dealt with disability in that kind of in the, in the central way, that way. I mean, yeah, that's legit in my experience. And Josh, you were also had a play at the <coughs> or one man show, the shit show 2.0, which I think had some involvement with the reachability, but normally you're more traveling in the, in the comedy circuit. Yeah, they, they produced it. Um, uh, I'm so okay, so. Well, I want to talk about that for a second. So, so first of all, uh, uh, yeah, uh, April is uh, far. More, I have a theater show, but but uh, that hasn't seen the light of day in like three years. But uh, but uh, April is far more involved in the theater scene uh, than I am, uh, winning that merit award from last night. So uh, I, I I dare you, theater people, to give her a part sometime if that's what she wants. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, so, so uh, and to, to again work contextual, uh, I, I can now I have blind to my disabilities there, uh, can't see a damn thing. But uh, what Sebastian was saying, absolutely, uh, there are a few scant exceptions that only prove the rule. Um, one th thing that sticks out in my mind, uh, you guys know that Mr. D show? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Billy Woods on there, right? And uh, playing uh, disabled. Uh, is a guidance counselor, I believe. Right. And Bill's a great guy, man, but Bill ain't disabled, you know, and uh, I'm not saying that that kind of thing necessarily needs to be banned. We really need a goddamn look at that, okay? Because can you imagine what we'd say nowadays if you had uh, uh, people putting on blackface to play black characters or, or <clears throat> a feminist uh, man or whatever playing all, all the female parts? Uh, uh, we are. We are completely whitewashed. I, I, I don't think it's so much from hatred as it is from ignorance. Um, but uh, yeah, like I gotta tell you, man, in my weaker moments, it makes me wanna wanna go like Tanya Harding, somebody check <laughs> play me roles, man. Hey, hey, I know my other man, I just wanna make you be able to play that role effectively. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in Halifax that would fit that role. 
Um, and luckily, they really, really wanted to be authentic and have somebody who knew the experience and not just put an able-bodied actor into that role. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty much non-existent here in the Maritimes, I would say. Nationally, there's a little bit more um, acceptance of uh, people in the disability community, but I think it's more so, again, uh, in that sense, they don't necessarily show them as disabled people. They do a really good job of just saying, you're a person and you're playing a role, and who cares if you happen to be on crutches or have a visual um, disability or be in a chair. You're just a person and you can play any role. Um, whereas here, the very few roles that do show up are for people who want to show that disability and they need somebody who can play that kind of a role. So was the show. Oh, thank you. It was Sit on My Face by Rolling Rolling Productions. <laughs> it was talking about sex and disability, which is even more rare. So, so what was the name of the production company? Uh, rolling Bolt Productions. Rolling Bolt, <laughs> but rolling is not disability related. No, so. no. no. And, yeah. To be honest, I forget the exact question again. Okay. <laughs> um, based on your experiences and travels, uh, where are we right now when it comes to representation disability? Oh, okay. So uh, to reiterate what everyone else has said, really bad. Um, and uh, I, I mean, from my perspective, I feel like it comes back to the fact that as a profession, acting is really bullshit. Like everything that you're that you're trained of, like as an actor, your body is your tool. And uh, in my opinion, most theater school students that I've seen all look the same. And you're told not to get tattoos because your body is your tool. And you have to be you have to be able to play anyone. And you don't want to be a man that's too effeminate or a gay man, you can't look past that for other characters, or you don't want to be chubby or fat, or you don't want to be physically disabled, you don't want to be anything that's not could play anyone, as opposed to saying like, well, we want to see reflections of ourselves on stage and there's so many <laughs> different people. We need people that... So you need to be tofu, basically. You need to be yeah. 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 And um, and so I think it leads to a lot of really boring the same on stage all the time. In each of your experiences, uh, from casting, writing, teaching, directing, what are some of the challenges in diversifying what we see on stage, whether that be disability, race, age, gender? All right. So I can answer that. Well, I guess from a, a director's perspective. Um, but what I've encountered as well, uh, talking to some people, is uh, to be open to casting someone with a disability. Uh, you also have to make it accessible. Uh, part of it, uh, working, I, I remember someone told me a story to be for mine, uh, working on a TV set, and they cast someone uh, in a wheelchair, and, which is great, um, but they didn't take it through the way of how is a wheelchair they get. So it's not just opening your mind about casting, it's about opening your mind to making the medium uh, accessible as well from a physical perspective. I think that's still a challenge. And often that's where people get hung up is that they you know, anticipate there being problems that don't exist or they completely ignore the you know, little combinations or tweaks that they have to make to how they just become accustomed to doing business. So, um, Sebastian, from your experience, you know, be that casting, writing, what have you, um, what are the challenges in diversifying what's being presented on stage? Well, I'm, I'm not a director, and so I don't cast. Um, but uh, as you know, as the the operator of the, of the venue, such as this, um, we don't really produce much of our own. Um, events here were primarily a rental venue, so what I can do here is help in the modest ways that we can um, facilitate events like tonight um, and, and, and be aware of 
what is overrepresented and what is underrepresented on our stage here, and try to um, uh, to diversify, you know, the, the, the programming that we have, what, what, what happens in this venue. Uh, and so I am aware of that in a general sense. Um, in, in terms of works where I curate the programming of the festival, I kind of have the same, uh, you know, um, intention. Uh, and Mayworks being a social justice themed festival is, and, and really has as part of its mandate um, bringing, shedding light and bringing to stage and, and, and uh, giving voice to uh, artists um, from marginalized communities or, um, or shining light on marginalized issues uh, that are underrepresented um, is part of that festival's mandate and, and as in my work as a community organizer I have um, you know, establish connections in certain communities, um, the, uh, the Mi'kmaq, African Nova Scotian, and, and queer communities here. Um, but in terms of the disability community, is not one that I have many personal connections to. Uh, Josh, from your experience, uh, what are the challenges in diversifying what's being presented? Oh, yeah, no, well, this, this is how I feel about, and I can't, can't speak for everybody else, but I can speak for how I feel about uh, the world sees me, and it's, we, um, at being with, with CP and that it's so visible, I, I feel that I'm perceived as less than human, some kind of quasi-modo or Caliban for Shakespeare, and uh, I think it's gross, it pisses me off, uh, I don't really think there are any chances. And you know, what, you know what someone said to me, they said, oh yeah, go, go see uh, Megan Leslie, you know, she's great, so just for it, she is great in a lot of ways. And I go, I go see Megan Leslie. She's a casting director now? No, but you know, she's trying to help me in comedy. She might, yeah, yeah, she's too busy saving the whales for green peas or something. But uh, I'm gonna do a nature film, maybe. But uh, so I go, I go see Megan Leslie, right? First thing she says to me, she goes, uh, "Oh, well, we can't actually find anybody." So I'm like, "Oh, she's what a waste of time, right?" But but then, but then, then she goes, "You know, Josh, I just, I don't think somebody can laugh at this ability or something. Tell me, laugh at a person with this ability." All right. Really, if this is what the progressives think, right? I'm fucked, you know. And so, so, uh, and so, to bitch about it on stage, to make it funny. I added the story. I go, but then I said to Megan, "Yeah, but Megan, Stephen Harper's a very handsome man." She <laughs> laughed so hard she spit a damn saliva right in my face. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, but that's uh, that's so. So I think to answer the question uh, more broadly, I, I think it's that, at least in my experience, the greater world uh, does not see me as a human being. I'm less than. So April, um, you know, from a little bit you said about your experience, um, you know, they were looking at, oh, this character, or the defining trait of this character is that they use a wheelchair. April may be a suitable actor for yeah. that, but if it were a character that just works at a back, yeah. Um, they wouldn't think that I could possibly jive with no. uh, that character that they've written. Um, and so you, to be involved, you know, focus on volunteering. So what else are you finding are the challenges? What's stopping uh, the people that are creating um, these opportunities? I think that on the writing level, on the kind of creation and dream level, there are a lot of people that are really open-minded to writing disabled characters and having them as part of their story. Um, or just letting a disabled person on stage to play their characters. Uh, I think where we see more challenges is in the funding level, in the overall societal acceptance of it. Uh, the big institutions still that are giving the funding that say, oh no, that's too much of a risk for me. I don't want to take that risk and step into the unknown. Um, so yeah, I think we're moving in the right direction, but it hasn't made its way all the way to the top yet to be to give that person a chance. Um, the ideas ideas are there, but we haven't really found a way to to push it, to take the risk, to see if it'll work. To see if a mainstream audience could relate. Really yes. Understand. Yeah. Or accept it. Yeah. Um, with that question, the uh, the thing that pops most into my mind of. Uh, recent theatrical activity is 
a mainstream version for us, mm -hmm. Neptune Theater presenting Kim's Convenience. Mm -hmm. And Kim's Convenience uh, was a, like, a very successful theater company coming in town, and this show had been very successful, so successful, in fact, that it was turned into a television show. One of the um, original actors from the theater production was in the television show, so there's like celebrity with it. That's usually all of the recipe that Neptune needs to sell out. When you get Heather Rankin in a, in a play for them and sell it out, you know? Um, and, uh, and they were having real problems with the sales. And I think they were having real problems with the sales because people that are of a majority are used to not having to um, empathize with anyone that doesn't look like them. And so if you see a poster for a show and the, the characters in that show don't look like you, it's very easy to, whether you're consciously saying it or not, go, oh, that's not... That's not for me. That show's not for me, and I'm, I'm not going. I don't think people are cautiously driving by and going like, oh, it's not white people, I'm not gonna go see that. But I think you look at the poster and you go, that's not for me. Whereas, like, I can say from, from my experience... We're a Shrek. We're a Shrek is for me. <laughs> we're a Shrek is for me. But, like, queer people grow up watching mostly movies with straight people, and you have to look at one of the characters, and you identify more with one of the characters, not because of their gender, but because like that character also plays guitar and you play guitar and that character lost their mom and you just lost your mom and you can identify with their self-consciousness about this, that, or the other. You identify with that person. You're not like, it's it's not the overarching label, right? And so um, I, think, I think sometimes it's like when you're talking about more mainstream uh, things like Neptune, when they do take a chance on something that's not reflective of everyone, in an easy way for people to empathize, and they don't get a financial return on it, it's it's unfortunate. It makes it less likely that they'll then take another chance, I think. I had a, a similar experience um, with the film that was presented here as part of the Windows Festival. Um, I had the first time tried to have, help organize a screening of a film with closed captioning with described video, so that the idea was that there could be a room full of people with mobility, impairments, vision, hearing impairments, no impairments, whatsoever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Everybody can get the same page and enjoy a movie together, which seemed like a really unique opportunity. Uh, partnered with a local, you know, repertory cinema company in town, and was really disappointed about a day or two before the event, been promoting it, described video, screening this movie, uh, kind of like a fun Hollywood youthful movie. Um, they added a second screening without description for the regular people. And so, oh, fly people, you come at seven, everybody else come at the nine o'clock show. Yeah. So great, now we have two theaters a third full instead of everybody sharing this experience. And so that was something I was really happy about with Ludo's here. Um, it's just to get everybody together, get everybody enjoying each other's company, yeah. enjoying entertainment in the same room. And so it's disappointing that you know, we're not really seeing that in theater and the music scene that you know, some musician in town who uses a wheelchair can barely get up on most of the stages in town, yeah. let alone get a cap to that stage. Yeah. Um, so definitely lots of work that still needs to be done. Um, Sebastian, um, have you encountered a stigma or misconception in your experience um, related to artists living with disability? No, uh, I um, I mean, I, I I should disclose that technically I am myself an actor with a physical disability, albeit a minor one, and one that's easily concealable. I have a club foot, so my left foot is uh, shorter by two and a half inches than the other, and uh, when I was born, it was turned backwards, so I had it operated and, and back, so the bone structure means that I can't move my ankle very much, I can't point my foot, so my calf is atrophied, and so I have a sling that's smaller than the other, but by wearing pants, I can easily hide that. Um, and so, uh, so I haven't faced stigma because of it, but, um, in, in many of the roles that I've, or much of the theaters that I've done was period theater where I've often had to wear breeches. Uh, and of course, breeches go up to here, and so uh, my disability became more apparent, or at least to me at first, I thought, uh, I thought that I was revealing something that I had the privilege of being able to hide very easily. Um, and, uh, and at first, I was often nervous about uh, about perhaps facing stigma about that, or having, you know, having being told it's distracting or whatever. Uh, you know, I was wrapped up in that, and of course, it never came up. And um, 
I even did show was an entirely naked, but of course, I was looking at my feet then. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, so no. Um, uh, so even though I, I do have a disability, I, I do have the privilege that I can very easily conceal it and uh, and not, uh, and, and so I have not faced stigma uh, because of that personally, and I have not, uh, I have not. Uh, witnessed stigma in, in a direct sense, but certainly, as the conversation suggests here, that um, that I've witnessed uh, uh, a very marked underrepresentation of uh, disability uh, in the arts, and, and that is a, a result 